All right, so I'm going to, to, going to uh, turn it over to Nick Gillespie of Reason uh, TV, who has also graciously agreed to uh, act as interlocutor. Uh, here you go, Nick. Thank you so much. Uh, can we, uh, can we uh, show uh, solidarity? Please put your, put your mask up. Put your mask up, please. Yeah, so... Thank you. So uh, to get right into it, uh, as Matt, I want to thank Matt and Carla in particular, but all of you for everything you're doing with the Free State Project to create uh, liberty in our lifetime. Edward Snowden, thank you so much for joining us. We're talking from the Liberty Forum of the Free State Project, which uh, in 2003, uh, created a project where they said we're going to get 20,000 people to agree to move to New Hampshire and make the state a uh, freer and more interesting, more innovative and fun place. Recently passed the 20,000 mark, so the great migration has, become, uh, has started. Uh, and at some point I've been asked to welcome you to come to New Hampshire to a free state uh, when you have time. <laughs> Uh, and I've been told that, among other things, uh, it will be a free and independent New Hampshire. They're, they're even getting rid of the state liquor stores, and uh, they're not going to have extradition with the rest of the United States. So hopefully you can join us. <laughs> so, um, let's talk about uh, a story that's very much in the news now, uh, the issue of Apple being requested by uh, court order to unlock the cell phone of one of the San Bernardino shooters. You recently tweeted, this is the most important tech case in a decade. Silence means that Google picked a side, but it's not the public's. Can you elaborate on that? And is Apple really on the public side? And how does strong encryption of personal communication, even when utilized by terrorists, strengthen freedom and liberty? Right, so this is, this is an incredibly complex sort of topic. When you think about the whole Google-Apple thing, first off, uh, Google did come forward. Their CEO made some comments in uh, sort of the defense of the ability of private enterprises not to be conscripted by government uh, to sort of do software work at their direction uh, rather than at the direction of their customers. Uh, now, it was very tentative, but hey, uh, it's a start. Um, and when we think about sort of Apple, you know, uh, are they the big champions of uh, liberty of individual rights? Uh, it's not really about that. Uh, we're not looking for the perfect heroes here, right? It's uh, don't love the actor, love the act. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that what the FBI is asking for here, right, is in the wake of the San Bernardino shootings, which are, you know, uh, of course, legitimate crimes. This is an act of terrorism. Uh, as it's been described. And they said, all right, we've got this private product out there that was designed to protect the security of all customers, not a particular individual customer, but it's a binary choice. Either all of us have security or none of us have security. And so the FBI went, well, yeah, 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 that's great. But uh, we want you to strip out some essential protections that you built into this program so that we can attack the program in a certain way. Uh, and as a technologist, this is deeply disturbing to me uh, because I know that we've had laboratory techniques uh, since the 1990s that allow us, uh, I, I apologize, uh, laboratory techniques since the 1990s that allow the FBI and other organizations that have incredible resources to unilaterally mount hardware attacks on the security of these devices, to re-engineer their software without compelling private actors, private enterprises, private individuals to work contrary to their will. Now, prior to this, there are important court precedents that have equated code to speech. It's an act of creation, an act of expression, when you are programming something, which is no different than sort of writing a paper uh, or um, building a house, these are things that are guided by your intention. And if the government can show up at any time to any house of any individual and say, regardless of your intention, regardless of your ideas, regardless of your plan, you don't work for you, you work for us, that's a radically different thing. And whether it's Apple or Google or anybody else, somebody else who at least challenges uh, that assertion of authority, 
and allows us to litigate that both in the courts and in the public domain, this is critical. Because prior to this moment, these things were being litigated in secret in front of a secret court called the, the so, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court uh, that in 33 years was asked by the government 33,900 times to authorize uh, surveillance or uh, reinterpretations of statutory law that are more favorable to the government that we never knew about because all of these decisions are classified. Uh, and in those 33,900 times in 33 years, the government got a no from this court only 11 times in 33 years. So that's why it matters. Well, here, that's why I think this is important. Can I ask a follow-up question? And part of this is legal, but part of it is also kind of technological. I mean, is any communication really secure anymore? Um, you know, David Brin, uh, 20 years ago, talked about the Transparent Society. But your privacy is done. Get over it. Um, and if no communication is really secure anymore, is it a problem um, or, or is there a way to actually hold the government accountable or to restrain it, or corporations for that matter? I mean, what, uh, uh, you know, is this beyond a question of government acting and corporate acting and individual acting? Because certainly Bryn was writing long before Facebook and social media where people are giving away, you know, just oodles of information again and again. So, you know, is, is any communication private anymore? And if it isn't, then what next? So this is a, uh, again, a really complex question that we could talk for a lot longer than the time we have on. Um, but the idea here is there, there are different kinds of surveillance, right? Um, there's mass surveillance, uh, which is typically done of communications in transit, right, as they cross the Internet over lines that you don't own, but you don't have a choice not to use because of the nature of the modern communications grid. Uh, you can't say, I want my communications to only route for this network. Um, once they leave your home, once they leave your uh, handset uh, for your cell phone or whatever device you're using, uh, it's out of your control and it gets routed invisibly across borders, across systems, across enterprises. Uh, the danger of this is that any one of these actors, whether they're corporate actors, whether they're governments, uh, and we know for a fact that governments particularly are abusing this uh, sort of... Uh, capability, um, as they transit, if they're transiting electronically naked, uh, that is unencrypted, anybody can read these, they can capture these, they can store these, they can do whatever they want with them, and there's no indication that it happened. Uh, so this is the property, of course, that spies like, uh, whether they're, they're corporate or um, state. It's that nobody, they, people don't even know that they're up? being spied on. Mean that they're, right. Does this, does this mean that there's nothing that works? No. Um, there are ways to shelter the content of the communication, which is uh, basically, if you think about what's in the email, uh, what's in the order that you register with Amazon.com or, uh, you know, the, the call that you made on a voice over IP system um, or the text message that you send through a certain app, they can no longer read that. All they can see, what you're doing is those communications that were electronically naked have now been closed. They've been armored uh, in a kind of thing that means, you know, they can't just kind of look under your skirt and see what's happening there. All they can see is that now there's a covered wagon sort of moving down the trail. Uh, that cover allows you to have some measure of privacy, but there's still a danger here, which is they can monitor the movements of the wagons. And this is what the government refers to as metadata. Right. Uh, how non-experts should think about it is me data. Uh, it's data about you. They're perfect records of private lives in the activities sense. They can't see what you're saying, but they can see who you're saying it to, when you're saying it, with what frequency. Uh, intelligence agencies use this information to derive what we call the pattern of life of individuals. Uh, and it's very much the same as what a private eye would develop and create and store if they were following you around all day. They can't sit beside you at every cafe you go into because you'll notice, hey, that's the same guy uh, that was there all the time. Or why is this guy leaning over to my table to hear my conversation? But they'll be near enough to see who you're meeting with when you got there, uh, what the license plate of your car was when you left, where you traveled to, where you slept at night. Uh, now, this stuff is being done on a mass indiscriminate scale to all of us, even today, uh, in sort of after these reforms. 
Uh, the government stopped holding these repositories of data for a particular phone collection program uh, who everybody in the country calls. But they said the phone companies can still hold this information and we'll just ask them for it. But for the internet, they haven't made any changes uh, to those programs as a result. Now, when we talk about the, the direct factual challenges there, there are two points. Uh, one is armoring the in-transit communications. This is a principle called end-to-end -end encryption. Now, the founding fathers in the United States used encryption to protect their communications. Uh, Benjamin Franklin created a number of enciphering systems himself uh, because he recognized that when great power uh, has intensely detailed private information uh, about the political activities uh, of groups that are acting in manners that they would find uh, inconvenient or burdensome, uh, it's going to be a very short revolution and we would have lost. Uh, so they, they've sort of asserted means of defense. That is what is happening today for the Internet as a standard. It's not targeted against the United States government. It's targeted against all actors who seek to subvert the intention of the users. We're trying to protect everyone everywhere across borders. We're not just fighting the NSA, right? This is about China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. Whoever you're afraid of, we can protect everyone from all of them by working together. Now, there is still that further uh, measure of metadata, sort of me data, again, the, the private activity records, where how do we conceal the fact that a communication occurred as opposed to the details that occurred within it. And that's still an area of active research. There are programs uh, that are developed that do help with this, uh, but this is still actively a topic of research. Uh, you know, uh, like uh, people like William Binney and Kurt Wiebe, Thomas Drake, um, you're, you're not against the government actually acting in, to ensure or to help the safety of citizens. Can you talk a little bit about what, what, would a, what would a government surveillance program that is legal and effective look like for you? What are, you know, how, how would they play that out without inevitably, uh, you know, at some point you talked about or you've written about how what the government can do and what it should do or, or what it will do are merging. There's no sense of morality. But how do we put that kind of stopping point where we have a government that can help protect us but not... Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, surveil us constantly. Well, the first point here is to recognize uh, that the nature of open societies, free societies, right, uh, nations at liberty, uh, is that life does entail some measure of risk. You're only going to be perfectly protected if you sort of uh, bury yourself under the ground or you live in a prison. And then uh, you'll still be at risk from the inmates who sort of are walking the asylum with you. Uh, life involves risk, it involves choice, it involves contest. That's where it derives its value from. That's where we progress from. We are tested every day by our environment. Uh, now, that doesn't mean we, we sort of uh, open the vest and assume that we should be vulnerable to any actor anywhere who wants to do us harm. Now, of course, we should take reasonable measures and we should work to create capabilities and measures uh, that allow us to identify wrongdoers and punish the wicked, uh, as things have always worked throughout sort of human history. Now, the method of law enforcement that we know works has been the model for thousands of years uh, that has done so. And that is that we use a, what's called a particularity requirement, which is really what the Fourth Amendment is about uh, in, in legal terms. The idea is we don't have a general warrant where the court says that anybody you think might be related to some class of activity, whether that's political or you want to call it radicalism uh, or anything like that. Uh, you just go, well, we think they're like that, so we're going to look at them. Uh, instead, you need some probable cause uh, that you can demonstrate to a court, right? This isn't just a gut feeling. You have to be able to lay out the evidence that this individual is engaged in some kind of wrongdoing, that they are a criminal, and it meets a threshold uh, that allows the court and the public sort of by proxy to go the interest in uh, sort of limiting these rights for this particular period of investigation uh, for the public outweighs that of the natural right that we all enjoy to be left alone without reasonable cause. Now, this is what has changed uh, in the wake of 9-11 and particularly uh, what 2013 revealed. 
Um, if the government is targeting a particular device uh, of an individual, or they're trying to tap a phone of an office that they know is involved in mob activity, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what we've always done. We've done this for hundreds of years. Uh, we have to have those methods of investigation. But at the same time, pre-criminal investigation, that is watching all of us all of the time, because we might someday become interesting, right? They want to go back in time uh, and look at all the records that they correct, collected in advance. Uh, the government calls this bulk collection. Everyone else calls it mass surveillance. Um, and say, well, you know, you've come to our attention today, but we know what you did on, you know, uh, June 5th, 1992, and we don't like that. That's a problem because it radically reorders the balance of power in society. Uh, it is preemptively uh, restricting our rights without any cause to do so, uh, to create a sort of surveillance time machine that allows them to go back uh, and say, no matter what you've done, uh, we know what that was. We can analyze you, we can assess you. And why this matters is it's no longer justice, it's only order. And these are very different things. Um, you know, six years ago uh, this month in 2010 in an Ars Technica forum under your uh, unfortunate pseudonym, the true hoo-ha, uh, you asked, did we, did we get to where we are today via a slippery slope that was entirely within our control to stop? And I'm quoting you, or was it a relatively instantaneous sea change that sneaked in undetected because of pervasive government secrecy? Uh, you know, with what you were just talking about, how would you answer that question now? Was it, you know, are we, are we frogs in a pot of water that's getting warmer and warmer, or was there a switch that was turned on, and that's, that's how this happened? So first off, let me caveat as a privacy advocate. Uh, I've never publicly owned uh, these posts, and this is not to say, you know, oh, these aren't me or anything like that. Uh, the individual in question who authored these posts seems to have a suspiciously large amount of uh, correlating events in their life that match mine. Uh, but the point here, <laughs> the point here is that when individuals write under pseudonyms, right, there's a reason for that. So individuals can be judged on the basis of their ideas, their uh, engagement in a particular conversation, rather than their personalities. Uh, and this has been a, a concept uh, that has moved forward public discussion uh, in the public commons, you know, not necessarily on the... the and, and certainly in American history, uh, the, cons uh, the Federalist Papers. Our, I mean, we are a country that was founded on anonymous speech in many ways. So you're participating, you or whoever it was, was participating in a grand tradition. For, for the sake of argument, let's presume uh, that individual was me. Uh, the idea here is, could we have arrested this slide? Uh, and at the time, uh, contemporaneous to that, I think it was circa 2009, 2010, uh, I was still working for the CIA, I had just moved to the NSA, I believe. Uh, and I didn't have uh, the same kind of comprehensive insights as to how the system had arisen. Uh, and of course, if I would have been in this position writing as this individual, uh, the idea would be, well, we should have seen this coming, right? Uh, it would have been incremental. There would have been some public indications. But when you look at the public record of how sort of the institutions of mass surveillance occurred in the United States, they occurred under a veil of secrecy. And when officials were challenged uh, by them, even under oath, even on camera, uh, they lied about them. And this is something important. If we sort of rewind to that post-2013 moment, uh, there were uh, stories published in, in uh, 2006 revealing warrantless wiretapping more, uh, James Bamford in 2012. And when you look at uh, sort of statements in front of Congress, uh, they looked a lot like this between Representative Hank Johnson uh, and former director of uh, the, or, sorry, uh, former director Keith Alexander of the NSA. Does the NSA routinely intercept American citizens' emails? No. Does the NSA intercept Americans' cell phone conversations? No. Google searches? No. Text messages? No. Amazon.com orders? 
No. Bank records? No. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. Uh, there are cases where they could in inadvertently, perhaps, uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. So this, this is sort of the challenge. Can we stop policies? Can we arrest them? Can we have a voice in them? Can we have a vote on them if they're intentionally and wittingly concealed from us? Talk about how does the government, uh, you know, by all uh, indications, if you look at Gallup or Pew or other surveys, trust and confidence in government to either be effective or to do the right thing. These are at at or near historic lows. How does government win back the trust? Because again, you know, and I'm going to ask the libertarian question in a second, but most of us here are libertarians, not anarchists, and the anarchist is crying in the background there. But, um, uh, but how does government gain back the trust and the confidence of the American people? Because we saw this in the 70s with the church commission hearings uh, and a general hollowing out of belief in government. And, you know, we want a government that is smaller than it is perhaps, but is effective and is legitimate. How does government win back the people's trust? Accountability. I mean... The whole idea behind the divide and, and the simple language of a private citizen and a public official is that we know everything about them and they know nothing about us uh, because they are invested with powers and privileges that we don't have. They have the ability to sort of direct the future of society. And as a result, it is incumbent upon them to assume a level of responsibility and accountability to the public for the exercise and abuse of those authorities that simply does not exist today. And that's the problem. They know more about us than they ever have in the history of the United States, and some would argue in any society that has uh, sort of existed before, at the same time that thanks to aggressive expansions of the state secrecy uh, authorities and use of classification and so on and so forth, and even simple management of the press where you know they, they play leaking games and uh, they don't give comment on this, that, or the other, or more directly aggressive things like we just saw with the director of national intelligence, uh, who's the most senior intelligence official in the United States. Uh, they're excusing themselves from accountability to us at the same time they're trying to exert greater power over us. And that, I think, leads to an inevitable result over time, whether through good intentions or bad, uh, that the public is no longer partner to government, but merely subject to it. Um, you uh, clearly from your Twitter feed, uh, you are following the presidential uh, nomination process in the United States. Um, Answer this, because this goes to that question of accountability. You've talked about how there's really no difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, the two major parties on these issues. Um, how does a country that offers up uh, you know, something like three dozen varieties of Pop-Tarts in every supermarket, how are we reduced to a non-choice in the political process? And, and not just despair, but how, how, do we, how do we change that so that there are voices that are saying, you know what, maybe surveillance state needs to be talked about more. I should caveat this with the fact that uh, I'm an engineer, not a politician. So uh, my opinions being what they are, uh, I look at systems in terms of incentives. Where are the incentives and how does human behavior emerge in response to those incentives? Uh, We've approached what in game theory terms is called a Nash equilibrium, uh, which is where you've got a, a limited set of choices that each player in the game can make. And they've identified uh, what is the most optimal uh, move that they can make within the context of that game. And so they play the same move every time, hoping that in some rounds they'll win, uh, even if over time it means they'll lose because they'll have the maximized score possible for the given set of constraints that exist. Now, what this means is that people go, well, I dislike this side, I dislike this individual, I dislike this tribe more than I dislike the other, therefore I'll pick this one. So they, they start voting against. 
Um, and it's important to have the principle of understanding uh, who I will vote for, but also who I won't vote for. But we need to disentangle this from parties. Uh, one of the reasons that I haven't endorsed anyone in the election is that I don't believe there's anyone in the race uh, that represents my values uh, at, at the current set in time. Now, this isn't to say this won't develop, this won't change, um, but it's not about who you hate the most, right? Uh, it's about who represents you. And not voting is also uh, a powerful action, right? You're revoking a mandate. Now, this can't work forever. Uh, it works in a tactical sense. But we need to think more broadly, uh, back in the kind of Samuel Adams sense, right? That small groups of people who are politically passionate can sort of light brush fires of liberty in the minds of men. Uh, that, uh, by the way, is the, is the ethos behind the, the Free State Project, so very much so, yes. So can I ask on a technical question then, can you vote in the election? I mean, where do you, can you send in an, uh, an absentee ballot? This would be, and if you do, will you, will you make your vote public? Uh, it's a secret ballot, but it would be kind of an interesting uh, observation to see who you voted for. Talk, you. This is, this is still a topic of active research. Okay, yes. Um, you know, the, as I mentioned before, this is an overwhelmingly libertarian crowd. And one of the things that libertarians talk about, besides reducing the size, scope, and spending of government and maximizing individual freedom, is recognizing that economic liberty and civil liberties are conjoined and inseparable. In some of the, uh, the shots that you showed, People were saying, like, you know, are you tracking Amazon purchases? Are you tracking cell phones? And we see the surveillance covers economic activity as well as civil uh, kind of or, or personal communication. How do you define your politics or ideology, and where did it come from? Do you consider yourself a libertarian or a classical liberal? Are these terms that are meaningful to you, um, or how do how do you think about uh, ideology? I guess. Well, you know, there, there's a whole field of political theory that I don't really subscribe to uh, in terms of classifying people on the basis of their beliefs, uh, because what it's trying to do is it's trying to establish tribes. It's trying to mm -hmm. establish common identities. And while I do think that is valuable uh, and important for the sense of collective action, uh, for me, it's not really the right fit. Uh, I do see sort of uh, a clear distinction between people who have a larger faith uh, in liberties and rights uh, than they do in, in, in states and, and institutions. Uh, and this would be sort of the authoritarian libertarian axis in the mm -hmm. traditional sense. Uh, and I do think it's clear that if you believe in the progressive liberal tradition, which is that uh, people should have uh, greater capability to act freely, to make their own choices, to enjoy a, a better and freer life, uh, over the progression of, of sort of human uh, evolution, you're going to be pushing away from that authoritarian axis at all times because authoritarianism is necessarily uh, about the ordering and control of society. Now, they can argue that that'll produce a better quality of life, but it cannot be argued that it will provide uh, a freer life. Uh, and for me, I'm on the side of freedom. Thank you. Um, you, uh, you have written in the past or said, our rights are not granted by governments, they are inherent to our nature, uh, it's entirely the opposite for government. Their privileges are precisely equal to only, to only those which we suffer them to enjoy. That's coming out of a, a classical liberal tradition of the American, the birth of American founding. You're an autodidact in many ways. Um, you, you, know, you don't have fancy degrees, and you know, I don't see diplomas on the wall behind you. Talk a little bit about the process of, um, you know, of how, were you, how did you educate yourself, and how does that play into larger roles of the types of education that, that governments or societies give people? Is it to liberate them? Is it to kind of subjugate them? Uh, and uh, talk about where you came from in terms of your ideas and your, your self-learning. I don't want to necessarily say that, that the modern education system is intended to, to subjugate people, but we do know uh, clearly that it's overlaying a certain set of values 
upon uh, everybody who's engaged in that system. Now, those values don't fit everyone, uh, and one might say they're not even uh, appropriate values uh, for a broad and diverse sort of liberal body, particularly one which has to go to cast votes uh, in a self-informed, critically thinking way. Uh, rather than one where, you know, the majority of education is, this is the history of this party and that party. Um, for me, yes, I did not graduate from high school. Instead, I got a GED. Uh, and I don't have the formal education. Now, that's held me back in a lot of ways um, in, in terms of just wanting to have some kind of formal education. It's difficult to go back and get later on, like chemistry, right? I'm, I'm really interested in chemistry, but lacking the formal education, uh, it's just kind of a pain to go back and read the textbooks later on. Um, at the same time, I have a very broad and diverse uh, education on a number of different topics. And this uh, has helped me in my professional career because I was uh, much more conversant and fluent on a number of topics that ended up being very highly valued in the national security space that really aren't taught in school, particularly when it comes to sort of system security and anonymity online, uh, in, in certain ways, how to combat that. Um, this illustrates a key point, which has been reflected by other thinkers before. It's, it's not original to myself, which is there is a very strong difference, a bright line difference, between your schooling and your education. Uh, and we should all be careful not to let the one influence the other. Talk about, I mean, because you, you were working with people and you've talked about this, who had similar backgrounds and technical skills, but then you brought a moral dimension to what you were seeing when you were working for the government or as a subcontractor. Did your education, I mean, is it a moral education that was lacking in the people around you or was there something in the way that you learned that triggered that sense of saying, you know what, we all know this is unconstitutional or this is wrong, but it was you who decided to actually bring it to the public's attention? Well, I, I represented a different generation in many ways uh, than the majority of sort of the, the institutional structure at the NSA and, and CIA because, of, of course, I was, I was the new group in. Uh, but I was also sort of the first generation uh, of children of the Internet, right? When you think about where my, my biggest influence are in that uh, context, my reading, my writing, uh, while, of course, yeah, we, we read the history, of course, yeah, we read the books and the traditions and the classics as well. Which classics do you get directed to, which come to your attention? That becomes part of sort of a zeitgeist debate that occurs all around the world. Uh, you have a much larger mixing of perspectives. And because of that, nationalism is uh, blind nationalism is less uh, effective in many ways, because there's a very real difference between allegiance to country, allegiance to people, and allegiance to state, which is what nationalism today is really more about. Uh, the institution can come and go, but the people remain. Um, and this, this kind of, of context is what differed. I brought a constitution in uh, and, and put it on my desk because I had a personal interest in it and I thought it was relevant to the work. And there were a number of uh, people that I worked with, coworkers and colleagues, particularly when I started raising sort of the alarm internally about these programs and saying something doesn't smell right here, uh, who agreed with me, who were interested, uh, who had different interpretations, who challenged uh, back and forth, but who cared. And then there were others who didn't, uh, who said the Constitution doesn't really matter, and who would literally say, you know, who cares about the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, uh, and so on and so forth, the First Amendment. Uh, it doesn't really matter. This thing's from hundreds of years ago. It's no longer relevant. And look, we've got a job to do. There's bad guys out there, uh, and we're going to decide who they are and what we're going to do about them. The problem with that, that I would argue, uh, is how designations of national security are made in the first place. There's a real life case here that I think is relevant to a lot of people uh, where the FBI had a lead on an individual. They were a religious leader, sort of a community leader uh, that the government, the state believed was in contact with or uh, under the sway of sort of agents of foreign power. And this is common with all people who are involved in any kind of radical politics. If you challenge the prerogatives of state, they presume it's at the direction of another state because that's simply how the thinking works. Uh, the attorney general was briefed on the case. They said, yeah, let's wiretap this guy. 
uh, even though he's a U.S. citizen, uh, son of a popular cleric, fairly well known. Um, and they put him on a watch list, said, uh, in the event of a national emergency, martial law, you know, FEMA and so on and so forth, we're going to detain this person because they're dangerous. They're a destabilizer. They are a radicalizer in the modern vernacular. Uh, and the FBI eventually made a determination that of all of the similar radicals in the United States, this individual was the most dangerous from the standpoint of national security. Does anybody in the room know this case? Do you recognize it? Mm. Yeah. And the determination was made two days after he gave the I have a dream speech. That is what a threat to national security looks like. There's a very real difference uh, between the public interest and the national interest. When you hear national interest, when you hear national security, think state interest, think state security, and you'll be on the right track. Uh, let me uh, uh, finish with three quick questions, if, if I might. Um, first, in the case of Ross Ulbricht, who was prosecuted for founding uh, the Silk Road website and is now effectively, uh, he's appealing it, but a life sentence, do you assume or should we assume that the NSA was involved in uh, corroborating or gathering evidence uh, which they might have denied in the actual trial? Yes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, that was easy enough. Uh, uh, two uh, questions. I mean, just just yep. to elaborate on that, I, I apologize because I, yep. I, I don't mean to be pat there. Yep. Um, but the NSA uh, in the United States is a member of a larger group called the Five Eyes Network, right? Uh, this is the United States, the UK, Canada, uh, New Zealand, uh, and Australia. Uh, and these five countries, they sort of mix everything together in a common pot, and they share and share alike. Uh, they're not allowed to ask a partner to violate their laws, uh, but partners can share information that would have been in violation of their laws uh, if they didn't ask for it. Now, not to say that particular strategy applied in this uh, context, but the difference between the national security agency's authorities and particularly the British uh, equivalent of the NSA called the GCHQ, their authorities, is the UK is allowed to use NSA systems, right, that we built that work in the United States and everything else, uh, against or under the mandate of what's called a serious crimes authority that's completely unrelated to national uh, intelligence prerogatives. Uh, and this includes drug trafficking. They are literally mandated for this. They use our systems for this. And then the fruits of their investigations, they can share freely with us. Uh, so I would say yes, of course. Uh, and it was foolish in the court case. Uh, I, I understand why they did it. Uh, he didn't want to own the server at the time. He didn't want to say, yes, this is mine. Therefore, the judge wouldn't allow him to make sort of a Fourth Amendment argument here that uh, investigatory mm -hmm. uh, restrictions had been violated. Um, but it seems uh, unthinkable to me that there was not an intelligence angle uh, internationally that was involved in that case. Do you, you know, we've talked about governments will do what they can do. Um, is there with something like Silk Road and uh, you could throw in something like uh, some of the activities of people like Kim.com and whatnot, will the government at a certain point, or will governments at a certain point when they realize, you know, the minute that Silk Road was closed, other sites crept up that were d dealing in larger numbers and more traffic. Will they give up? I mean, will, and will they come up with a different way of either regulating or minimizing harm that might arise from this? Or will they always be perpetually chasing after and kind of trying to, you know, uh, and I mean this in the broadest terms possible, always going after kind of nickel, nickel and dime dealers in, in activities that they don't want? Or will they finally say, we can't really surveil everything, nor should we, and so we'll come up with a different way of dealing with technological innovation and human commerce? Uh, I'm not sure. Again, this is something that's, that's quite beyond my expertise, but I would say there are models in history to look at, to sort of draw from. Uh, look at the prohibition on alcohol. Um, eventually, crime groups gained influence, they gained power, and they were difficult to combat as a result. Uh, therefore, the government reevaluated the policy and found that it would be more in line with their interests, not mm -hmm. public interests, but their interests. Uh, if they ended that prohibition. Um, and we see similar things happening with the prohibition of marijuana today. Uh, now, that's not to say that I think there will be necessarily a global free for all, but we are, technology is providing new means to enforce human rights. Uh, 
uh, and traditional compact concepts uh, of human interaction uh, through technology rather than through law uh, across borders, regardless of jurisdictions, uh, which allow people to communicate privately, uh, associate privately, uh, care about one another privately um, without, you know, for example, in Russia, uh, there are prohibitions on who and how you can love one another, as there were in the United States quite recently. Um, and this, this kind of thing is being challenged in ways that I think will be difficult to subvert. Does this mean that sort of great powers are just going to, you know, throw their hands up, give up and walk away? Uh, I think that's unlikely. Um, however, the individual is more powerful today uh, than they ever have been in the past. Mm -hmm. And this is why you see governments that feel threatened uh, by an individual like Julian Assange, who's trapped in an embassy, right. because despite the fact that they can control the physical location of someone, uh, the power of the reliable sort of old bad tools of political repression uh, are increasingly losing their weight. And I, uh, you know, the irony is not lost where you're sitting in an authoritarian you know, the, uh, an authoritarian regime talking about how people are freer and more empowered than ever. So, uh, you know, I mean, th that that is an irony that I hope that people will cogitate on for a long time. Talk about, uh, you know, when we talked about the presidential election, um, what would a candidate have to do in order for you to say, you know what, that is the type of thinking on surveillance or on individual freedom and liberty from surveillance that I could get behind? What what would they have to do? I, I mean, again, this, this sort of political direction gets beyond my expertise, so I don't like to talk too much about that. But, you know, you, you brought up an interesting point there about Russia that I think is actually important to contextualize. Uh, there's a lot of fair criticism, reasonable criticism that's like, hey, this guy's in Russia. Uh, it's important to understand that I never intended uh, to end up in Russia. Uh, originally, I was hoping to get to Iceland. Uh, after that, Latin America, uh, when Iceland fell through. Uh, but the State Department canceled my passport trapping me in Russia uh, when I was initially on the route, as soon as they heard I was in the air. And despite the fact that I've asked several times, they've refused to reinstate it, which is quite interesting. Uh, the United States, of course, criticizes me for being in Russia. At the right. same time, they won't let me leave. Uh, but be that, as it, be that as it may, there's, there's, there's a deeper point here, a philosophical point here uh, about hypocrisy. Uh, is it hypocritical? Uh, to be somewhere else and not be concerned or as concerned with that locality uh, as you are uh, with your home. And I would argue that it's not. Uh, I owe my first duty, my first allegiance, my first loyalty to fixing my country before I try to solve the problems of the rest of the world, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We've got to get our house in order first. Uh, that's not to say that I haven't criticized the policies of the Russian government. Uh, which I think in many cases are, are clearly indefensible, particularly when it comes uh, to how they reach into the internet, how they reach into private lives, private homes, in ways uh, that are not okay in Russia, they're not okay in the United States, and they're not okay anywhere. Uh, and this is something that I expect to continue, but uh, the thing that I hope for the most, the thing that I care about uh, the most, is let's set the standard in the United States that it has embodied traditionally, that is, we are the example for the rest of the world to emulate. We don't want people to hold us up as an example, as in uh, today and recently this week, uh, in this Apple versus FBI case, where uh, Apple, by the way, just uh, yesterday uh, had a call with the press where they said no country in the world has asked us to provide the authorities that the FBI is doing today. Uh, we don't want Russia or China or North Korea or Iran or France or Germany or Brazil or any other country in the world to hold us up as an example for why we should be narrowing the boundaries of liberty around the world rather than expanding them. I, um, thank you. Sadly, uh, so that's another way of saying you definitely won't be voting in this election, I think. Um, 
A final question, and this goes to you know part of what the Free State Project is about, because it is a brush fire for freedom and for liberty, and it's 20,000 people, and even already with less than 2,000 people who have moved here, they've changed various types of laws and culture, uh, which is as important of New Hampshire, which is already a pretty free, uh, free-willing place. Um, you talked about being a kind of a, a child of the internet. Um, you know, many of us are parents. What you, our children should read the internet in its entirety. But what are the places? Uh, no, and, and and it is true because it decentralizes knowledge, and and you come across, you know, the serendipity of all sorts of perspectives, um, which is is incredibly uh, empowering and and important. But what what are the what? How should children, you know, what are the texts that they should read or what are the what are the practices that are good that would give them an independent, critical, uh, you know, ability to kind of move into a world which is both nationalistic in a good sense. Uh, you're an American and you seem to be still proud of being an American and there's something there worth preserving. But but there, you know, so we can be nationalist, but not status. Where do we go on the Internet? Where should we be uh, asking our children to spend some time? I I think it's less important to go to specific texts as to demonstrate how specific texts are written. If I were a parent uh, trying to help my child understand the Internet, uh, the key exercise that I would do is I would go look at cases that are super partisan today, right? Uh, Extraordinarily charged. And I would get uh, two radically different rewritings of the same story. Uh, and I'd make them read both. And I do this on a number of different things to show, uh, because this is something that, that uh, a lot of older people fall prey to who aren't so familiar with the internet and they you know, just get their news from their single landing page portal or whatever. And also young people who get super filter bubbled because they sort of opt into communities that, that create sort of a group think where it's always people who are agreeing with what they say. Uh, which was not available in the same way uh, 20 years ago on the Internet and 10 years ago on the Internet, uh, really, where it, there, there weren't walls that were quite so high separating communities. And the idea here is to show that the truth lies spread across the abundance of sources. Uh, The beauty of the Internet is that you no longer have to rely on a single source. You no longer are vulnerable to the broadcast. That is, this is sort of the voice of truth. This is the voice of facts. But it's important to understand that the uh, sources that you prefer can still be wrong, uh, even if they've got the the right principles, the right ideas, the right values. Getting the facts right matters more than anything else. So this, I mean, you're talking about the Internet really as the fulfillment of the Enlightenment project of kind of competing versions of truth and a marketplace of ideas and an understanding about the construction of knowledge and truth rather than its self-evident presentation without argument following. You can just nod. (laughs) So, okay, well, let me, uh, for a final, final question, what what would be the conditions under which you uh, you would voluntarily return to the United States? Um, Are there are there concerns or rather are there are there terms that you would be uh, happy for? And this is something, again, not to harp on politics, because all of us, I think, are living our lives beyond politics. But. That's one of the things you hear, like, well, you should come back and, you know, have your day in court, et cetera. But what what would be the conditions under which you might return? Right. So this is interesting. It's actually evolved quite a bit. Originally, uh, I volunteered myself for prison. Um, But I said that I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't allow myself to be held up as a deterrent to other people who are trying to do the right thing. Uh, And that was fundamentally contrary to what the government wanted to do. Of course, they wanted to sort of nail a scalp on the wall uh, as a warning to the others. And even though uh, I was quite flexible here, it was Daniel Ellsberg uh, who leaked the Pentagon Papers, the secret classified history of the war in Vietnam in 1971 that showed that the government had not only lied us into the war, but they kept lying to keep us in it, despite the fact that they knew there was no way to win. Uh, And he told me that uh, this was a mistake. uh, And eventually he convinced me of this. in the sense of to what do we owe our first loyalty? To law 
or to justice and to submit ourselves uh, to, to sort of a government that is intentionally trying uh, to deter the political beliefs and political acts of other people merely on the basis of law as though that were a substitute for morality or superior to morality is a very dangerous precedent to set. Now, I'm still, this is, I, I think most people uh, might be surprised by this, but, but fairly more uh, trusting in the value of government institutions than Daniel Ellsberg, uh, who, who since his initial work uh, has just, uh, he's been an extraordinary crusader and a true radical in the best way uh, for more than a generation now. But when it comes to wh what's the current context, what's the current state of play that we've, we've been at? Uh, I've told the government that I would return if they guarantee a fair trial where I can make a public interest defense uh, of why this was done and allow the jury to decide uh, if it was right or wrong in the context of both legality and morality. Uh, and the United States government responded with a letter from the attorney general saying they promised they would not torture me. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I have that, I have that letter. Uh, so it's, it's still kind of a work in progress, but we'll see where it goes. Well, thank you uh, so very much for your time. Uh, and uh, from, uh, again, beaming from uh, a, an incredibly, or a more free, free state project in New Hampshire. Uh, thank you for your time and for your comments so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you in New Hampshire.